So I remember how, as I was going through diaconate formation, my absolute biggest fear about becoming a deacon was the thought of preaching. It was something that I didn't want to do. It was something that I didn't feel called to do. Even worse, it was something that I wasn't sure I could do. After all, I didn't have any experience as a public speaker, and I was certainly no scripture scholar. So I was scared to death that on any given Sunday, I either wouldn't be able to come up with something to say, or if I did come up with something to say, would I be able to say it very well? And these lingering fears of mine only grew bigger the closer I got to ordination. And then one weekend, I had a strange but wonderfully affirming experience. Tim Morris, a friend and a parishioner here at Transfiguration, who is a huge Pittsburgh Steelers football fan, invited me, a huge New York Giants fan, to go down with him to his hometown of Pittsburgh to watch the Steelers play the Giants. And I jumped at the opportunity. The Sunday morning before the game, we went to Mass at the church that Tim's family attends. And I'll never forget it. Father Bud, the beloved and long-tenured parish priest, gave the homily. And it started out beautifully, too, as he preached about love and especially God's unconditional love for us all. But then somewhere along the way, he began to struggle and his homily strayed off course, where all of a sudden his focus pivoted to criticizing comedians who cursed or talked about sex during their routines. And he finally finished it off by suggesting that all these comedians are probably going to hell. What? <laughs> all of which left me wondering, what the heck just happened there? But almost before I could even finish that thought, I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I can at least do that with a homily. Which for me was a wonderful gift of grace because with that simple and comforting thought, my fears and my doubts about preaching seemed to melt away. Because if someone as well respected and loved as Father Bud could struggle with a homily, then I think I was allowed to too. So it was right then and there that I decided not to worry about how good or bad my preaching might be. Instead, my only promise to God was that I'd always prayerfully keep my heart open and give any homily my absolute 100% best effort and then let the Holy Spirit do with it what she will. And it isn't lost on me that after further reflection, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit did with Father Bud's homily. Because as I look back on it, I'm now fully aware of how what initially seemed like to me to be a really bad homily instead turned out to be one of the most important and impactful homilies that I would ever hear. Who would have thought? Now, you're probably wondering what any of this has to do with our gospel today. Well, we just heard Jesus call John the Baptist the greatest prophet our world has ever known which makes sense because John had known Jesus all his life. Before he was born, John leaped in his mother's womb when Jesus in Mary's womb came near. John was the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River and heard God's thunderous voice say, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. John was also the one constantly telling the world to make straight for the way of the Lord and he even told his own disciples that they should stop following him and instead follow the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet, despite all this experience with Jesus, as John sat there in prison, he had doubts. That's why he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? John was essentially saying, I believed all my life that you're the Messiah, but right now, in this moment, I'm not sure. I'm struggling. I need some assurance. 
So just as Father Bud struggles with his homily, gave me permission to have struggles with mine, for all of us, if John, the greatest of all prophets, can struggle with his faith and he can have doubts, then so can we. Plus, if John could admit his uncertainty to his disciples, something important enough to be recorded in Scripture, then surely all of us can also have the freedom to be candid about and share our doubts with others. Whether it's doubts about our church, her teachings, or the direction she's heading, whether it's doubts about ourselves, our worthiness, or our spirituality, or even if it's doubts about the very existence of God, John, the greatest of all prophets, admitting his doubts, should give each one of us permission to express and explore our own doubts. After all, as Paul Tillich, a great Christian philosopher and theologian, pointed out, God does not stand aloof or apart from our questioning, but rather God is in the midst of our doubts, eventually making himself better known through them. Doubts, therefore, rather than being something that should be feared, should instead be embraced as a vital part of any faith journey. Because if we never doubt or struggle, our faith will never grow. In fact, if someone didn't have doubts, I'd be a little worried about them. Because the opposite of doubt is not faith, it's certainty. And religious certainty can be a dangerous thing. It can lead to self-righteousness or apathy, both of which can block our capacity for self-awareness, destroy our humility, and hinder our desire to learn all of which can stunt our spiritual growth. With too much certainty, we get dangerously close to becoming what one wise theologian described as God's frozen people. So the question is not only is it okay to doubt, because we've already seen and learned from John that it is, but the question also becomes, what should we do with our doubts? And young people, this is an especially important question for you because it's easy for me to stand up here and say that doubts are a good thing. But as you'll soon discover, if you haven't already, doubts can cause a lot of anxiety, not only for you, but probably for your parents too. So whether it's doubts about yourself, like I had about myself and my ability to give a homily, or it's doubts about your faith, I believe having and then working through your doubts will be an important part of your faith journey. Working through your doubts will make you stronger, but it's often a slow, troubling, and sometimes painful process. So while working through your doubts is good, it's certainly not easy. Which is why I think our gospel today also teaches us a few things about how we should handle our doubts. First, there was John's response, which was to take his doubts right to the source. John just didn't sit there frustrated and angry, allowing his doubts to grow into resentment or apathy. He didn't wallow in his doubts. Instead, he acted on them by sending his disciples to put those doubts directly in front of Jesus, which is exactly what we should do too either through our prayer where we humbly ask Jesus for his guidance and understanding, or by sharing our doubts with others, whether it's with a priest, a spiritual director, or a trusted friend. Because Jesus is also present there and can speak to us through our church community as the body of Christ. The second thing to notice is how Jesus responded to John's question. He was patient and gracious. He didn't get upset. He didn't criticize John for his lack of faith because Jesus isn't shaken by our doubts or offended by our questioning. He loves us even as we struggle. And even more, he loves it when we include him in our struggles. In fact, Jesus knows that it's through his love that will eventually come out the other side of our doubts feeling even more secure in ourselves and our faith because deep doubt is often the prelude to an even deeper faith. 
And finally, as a spiritual director, I love how Jesus answered John's question. He didn't simply say, yep, I'm the guy. Instead, he told those disciples to go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. All the Old Testament prophesied works of the Messiah that we heard about in our first reading today from Isaiah. In other words, Jesus was telling those disciples and John and us to go and see for yourselves, to hear for yourselves, to decide for yourselves. Because ultimately, Jesus in his wisdom knows that in order to deal with real doubts, we must do real work which then becomes the unshakable foundation of our faith. My brothers and sisters, as we sit here in this third week of Advent, a time of waiting and wondering, and maybe even questioning, our hope is not for a faith without doubts, but instead having faith within our doubts. Our hope is for a faith that is ultimately strengthened by our doubts. So we should take comfort in the thought that we can endure any doubts because no matter how many we may have, God never doubts us. No matter how much we don't know, we can be sure that God knows and loves us. And no matter how many answers we may seek to possess, the ultimate answer will always be to let Jesus possess us. That's what our gospel today is about. That's what our lives are about. This is the love of Christ that will never let us go. So my brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of your doubts. Instead, have faith while embracing those doubts. As we each stumble along in our journey to God, we can all at least do that. <laughs>